working on this program in Mexico for, for many years. And in a sense, the reason I've been working on it for so many years is to try to finally be able to answer the question of the long-term effects, uh, which is, I'll say in a minute, is really, to me, kind of the most interesting question of, of these intergenerational effects. So this paper is a kind of a first start to, to try and answer some of these um, long-term questions. Uh, so first, let me start with the motivation. Oh, and I forgot to say this is a joint work with my um, co-author, Tom Bobo, who's now at UC. OK, uh, so um, you know, what's of interest of CCTs, about CCTs? And it's really kind of remarkable you know, the extent to which uh, conditional cash transfers over the last 20 years, uh, since the start of the program in Mexico and another in Brazil, uh, they've really become a central strategy for poverty alleviation uh, around the world. So in over 80 countries, uh, currently versions of uh, CCTs, uh, they began in Latin America, they're all over uh, Latin America, but they've also spread um, across to other continents in Africa and Asia, and even some pilot uh, programs in the U.S. Um, and Europe. So what kind of innovation? Uh, so the main innovation, you know, why has it you know, gotten so popular or so attractive for governments to implement uh, these kind of programs? And the main idea is the conditional aspect. So it's not new to give money to the poor. That's what CCTs do. Uh, but what was new was this idea of giving these benefits conditional. And what are they conditional on? Uh, on linking, you know, they link um, transfers to invest in human capital. And this typically means, in most programs, on kids going to school. So it's money that goes to the poor, but the, the school enrollment of children and attendance is monitored. And so if they don't comply with that, they don't, don't receive the money. So in that sense, uh, it's conditional. So why is that you know, interesting? And it's really uh, this kind of dual aim uh, strategy. So it's not just you know, giving money to the poor today, but they're better off today. Although I would argue that's a hugely important uh, aspect. But it's this hope that by the conditionality that you would also, you know, you would have kids who go more to school because of the program and later on, you know, when they grow up, they'll be less likely to be poor. So it's really kind of the second goal that, you know, kind of two goals in one <laughs> program, the second goal that has uh, gotten the attention that you can also uh, kind of reduce, you know, the intergenerational transfer of, of poverty. Okay, so, so the motivation, that's our big question, um, uh, I would say, of CCTs is, you know, what, so what's, <laughs> what actually happens? So does growing up, you know, with a CCT program actually improve your economic outcomes in adulthood? So it seems pretty likely that if you basically kids are paid to go to school, that that would have uh, some sort of a no-brainer that, all right, if they have more education, they'll have, you know, better jobs. Uh, when they, you know, when they grow up, but that's actually an uncertain uh, proposition, and in fact, you know, the results uh, in some sense reflect that, uh, and the reason is, you know, the, most of these CCTs operate, in the Mexico case included, in very poor rural areas where the quality of schools uh, is, is low, and so you might think that kind of additional schooling in poor schools doesn't have that much of a labor uh, market return also in the rural areas where these programs operate mostly agricultural and also might think that returns to schooling are lower in agricultural areas. Actually the short term and kind of medium term evidence in the fact backs up this concern because there are kind of positive effects on schooling uh, but pretty mixed evidence on test scores. So it's sort of a story where kids are spending more time in school but you know that's not showing up on, on uh, increased learning. And so that's uh, kind of another uh, reason you might be concerned that this increased schooling is not really going to be of much benefit uh, later on. Could you say, just say a word about the kind of the margin that parents are at? Is, is most kids going to school and it's kind of a question of whether they're going to show up in fifth to sixth grade or where do you think this is? Right. So in fact, the kind of big education effect is getting kids to go into secondary school because most kids, even in poor areas, uh, go to practice. So there's a, but you know, in secondary school, only about half of kids went on before the program. So there's definitely potential for, for increasing. Okay, so what did this paper do? Uh, it looks at sort of long-term effects uh, in, in a nationwide uh, program, which is the Mexican case. 
the outcomes we look at are schooling, uh, labor market performance, uh, living standards, and, and migration. And migration actually has a fair amount to do with the effects we see. Okay, so the, our case study then is uh, based on, on PROGRESA, so uh, sort of Mexico's uh, pioneering program. I'll say more about more of a description of the program in a few minutes. Uh, so it's one of the first, and uh, I would say mainly because of the, you know, it's kind of one of the first social programs in a developing country to do an RCC back in 1997, so it became very well known uh, uh, because of that. Um, so it started in 1997, so this means that uh, the earliest beneficiaries, if you were a child in the late 90s now, you're sort of old enough to be in uh, the labor market. Uh, as I just said, there was a you know a widely um, studied initial RCT, um, and so you might say, well, we're not going to use that RCT in our data. You might say, why not? Um, and that's uh, there is actually a, a Karen McCurse from um, uh, Paris Paris School of Economics is actually doing a follow up, following up the original uh, RCT. Um, uh, so, but you know, part of the problem with the original RCT is the control group got the program 18 months later. And so even if you sort of follow this group 20 years later, you have a group that got the program 20 years versus 18. Um, so anyway, we have a, a different approach um, and we're going to use the, uh, the Mexican census um, and merging administrative information. It's a, you know, it's a difference in difference a strategy and they'll take advantage of differences in exposure to the program precisely around this uh, transition from primary at uh, the secondary school, we're going to use variation in the timing of the program across uh, municipalities uh, nationwide. You know, the you see sort of a complementary effort to following up uh, the original experimental cohort. So we have kind of more variation because we take advantage of, of uh, sort of a longer term difference in program exposure. And we also, you know, have a, you know, by using the census, we have more representative impacts uh, Nationwide, because this is the sort of the initial uh, RCT uh, was based only on 500 communities, whereas the program now is in 100,000 uh, communities nationwide. Okay, so uh, quickly, what are what are our uh, results? Um, so uh, just a quick, quick preview. So we find that education, the overall effect of growing up with uh, the program versus not growing up with the program, is an increase in school only of 1.3. Uh, grades, that's very, actually, uh, sort of checks with all these other studies using the initial uh, RCT. Uh, what do we find in the labor market? The labor market is really a women's effect uh, story. So we find uh, kind of, this is a population that doesn't tend to work a lot outside the home, women in these rural areas in Mexico. Uh, so they have a large increase in their labor force participation. As a result of that, their earnings go up uh, by, by a lot. Uh, the effects for men are are positive, but somewhat um, uh, somewhat small. Uh, as a result, household earnings uh, also uh, increase, and we also find that there's a lot of migration. And so, uh, you know, this is part of uh, likely where these increases in work um, and income come from women through migrating to more urban areas. Okay, I'm gonna I'll talk about the robustness. So I'm gonna skip that um, now. Uh, okay, so. This just shows kind of the overall aggregate pattern of enrollment in, in the program starting in 1997. So it just shows the number of households enrolled uh, each year. Um, and so you can see there's sort of these peaks and uh, troughs of enrollment. You know, the years where there's no enrollment, those are election years. Uh, so which are every six years in Mexico and kind of the midterm elections are every every three years. So the program rules, um, you know, they start to evolve over time, but they're really not supposed to enroll households very close to uh, to the election. And, and that's, so, that's new enrollment. So when households are in, then they tend to right. stay in okay. permanently. Correct. Right. So, I mean, there is some drawback, dropout with households that don't comply with, with conditions. Yes. Um, are there returns to school similar to what you would expect in one point three years or more or less? Yeah, so um, we have tried to do that to calculate. It's very noisy. It's you know because there's so much even in this population a lot of inequality, so they're they're noisy. But I think you know that's something we could work on 
one line more. This is our back out that we'll return. Uh, you also have the help uh, after the report, right? Correct. Uh, so, yeah, so that's, that's a good clarification. What we're looking at here are the overall effects of the program. So we you know, can't really say, you know, in a sense, I'm telling a story where I say it's because of the education, these labor market effects, but it also might be because uh, the kids are healthy, you know, or they grew up with more food in the household, which, you know, which they did. So, yeah, that, yeah, it's a bit of a black box, all the, the sort of the aggregate, the total effects. Okay, so, but sort of one thing from this graph, though, that I want to state was kind of useful then for just justifying our identification strategy is we have these sort of different phases of program enrollment. And so in a sense, uh, part of the variation that we use is looking at kids who were exposed to the program uh, in the late 1990s with kids and families who got the program later on. So we're not comparing um, beneficiaries with non-beneficiaries, we're comparing uh, households or kids in households that got the program earlier versus, versus later. Okay, so a quick uh, a summary of. Uh, I, just, I didn't understand. The household that's not enrolled, is it because they didn't choose to be enrolled in the past, or is it because you only become eligible when your child's a certain age, so there's a natural cohort for you to belong to, and you just happen to land in an election year? Or, I don't quite understand. That. Yeah, um, so it's, yeah, I should have a slide on this, on the targeting, uh, it's means tested. Mm -hmm. um, so based on sort of geographic, you know, how poor the community is. And so it's means tested as a household survey. You're interviewed. You know, if you sort of are below a cutoff, you're selected for the program. Everybody selected enrolls. So there isn't sort of selection from people who are offered that don't enroll or very little. But that variation is from changing income cutoffs or changing geographic eligibility? Also, oh, why do some households get the program later uh, versus earlier? Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's something we look a lot at. Uh, so, you know, an argument mostly down to budget, you know, from you know, having more budget uh, later on. And so we have kind of initial program documents for planning of the program. And so, you know, it's true that sort of poor communities got the program uh, first. And so we try and control for, for that through different kind of community level indicators. Okay, so um, the program then, uh, so conditions transfers to families, um, conditional human capital investment, which in Mexico consists of school attendance and enrollment. Uh, so you have to go to school 85% of the time in a month. Uh, so, you know, if you're absent, you have that excuse. Um, it's also part of the money is also tied to regular health clinic uh, visits. Uh, the transfers are given directly to the female uh, head of uh, uh, the household. This is a huge program uh, in Mexico, so at its peak, and I'll talk about what's happened actually in the new government if I have time at the end, um, but uh, six million uh, households, it's about a third, almost a third of households in Mexico. The average, how much do these households get? Uh, so it varies based on the schedule, which I'll, I'll show in the next slide, but about $50 monthly. This is a big increase in income for these families, about a third of their baseline uh, income. It's uh, means, means tested of 97% uh, of those who are offering the program uh, accept. So for our identification strategy, we're going to use uh, the results from uh, the short-term evaluations, which show that the education effects really occur uh, at the transition between primary and secondary. Uh, school. And this is sort of the idea that if you're sort of lucky to get the program was offered to you as you were sort of finishing primary school, it has a big effect in getting kids to go on to secondary school. But if you were offered the program when you were 15, you maybe already dropped out and kind of gone on to secondary school, there's very little uh, effect on your enrollment. So it's not enough to kind of get you to go back, back to school. And so the age at which, you know, sorry, the program drops on you is one of our sources of, of identity. Okay, um, so then also I'll just mention, uh, so those are sort of the results from the short-term education uh, studies, and I'll just mention there are many other, as I was alluding, we were alluding to a minute ago, there are a lot of other studies based on the short-term experimental evaluation on, you know, there's over 100, 150 uh, studies showing effects on health, consumption, income, 
assets, women's data, and those uh, are summarized if you're interested in more, um, more information in uh, JEL, uh, recent publication um, by myself and Petra, Petra Tan. Um, what about previous studies on the long-term effects? So there are starting to be, uh, you know, all these 80 other programs in different countries are now some of those are starting to be um, almost as old as the, as the Progressa uh, program. Uh, you know, the few that look at labor market outcomes, there aren't really any that have sort of a long-term, like 20 years uh, post, but they are showing pretty mixed studies, mixed, uh, mixed evidence on, on the effects of, of the labor market. Mm. Okay, this is uh, this that graph actually just comes straight from uh, a paper by uh, Behrman, Sengupta, and Todd, uh, which shows the initial effects on on enrollment. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you kind of look, say, oh, so the top graph shows the baseline where there's sort of no difference between the treatment and control group, and this is from the initial uh, RCT. And then you can sort of see the enrollment uh, effects that open up. Not that there aren't any at the primary uh, full level, but there are some effects in other studies on repeating uh, grades, but there's sort of a big enrollment effect around uh, the age of 12 or, or 13, which corresponds to entering uh, secondary uh, school. So this is just kind of some, um, supporting evidence for our um, identification strategy. That's the same thing. I'm going to skip that. Um, okay, so this gives you an idea of the amounts and how the program was structured. So the grants um, vary. So this, these amounts show the monthly amount of the grant that you would get for each child uh, in, uh, in the family um, uh, and it, distinguishing by uh, boys and girls. And so actually it has this kind of interesting feature that girls in the secondary and high school level, so high school grants actually didn't exist in the initial version of the program, were added in 2001. But you can see for, so first the grants go up with grade, and that's just a function of opportunity cost being higher uh, for kids as they get older. Um, and then the other interesting thing is the grants are higher for girls uh, and boys, and that, um, you know, that was motivated by girls tended to have a higher dropout rate after fifth grade. Uh, that boys actually ignore that uh, girls fail less grades than boys. So I think actually it wasn't um, necessarily um, based on that anyway. Right? Uh, it's sort of necessary to achieve uh, kind of gender equality. But actually, it turns out uh, she might have worried that um, this would lead to kind of higher effects on girls and boys. Um, uh, but actually, it's uh, it doesn't. And Mexico is not a country that has uh, gender gaps in education, uh, so at least not, a, not, not anymore, but um, anyway. Okay, those, and just uh, completeness, though, so there, you know, people worried when the program was started that you, know, you could have effects on fertility, have more kids to get more money, and so benefits are, are capped. Um, so you said no effect on fertility, the studies have been done? Yeah, um, the short-term studies that have been done have not found that I'm working on a longer term study, and actually, it it looks like there might be effects on adolescents, like reducing fertility, but not on kind of older older women. Okay, so the research design then is comparing basically two the two waves of enrollment. Uh, so the first wave and uh, so our second wave, um, and so I'll show that. You know, there's, they're not identical, and this is still something that we're um, struggling um, with uh, in terms of the kind of the, you know, this question, do households that are enrolled earlier look similar to those that are enrolled uh, later? Um, and then, so that's sort of the one uh, difference. And then the other difference is looking at the age at which you were exposed uh, to the program. So whether you were under 12, which um, we use as a proxy that you sort of we're at the right time to benefit uh, from the program in terms of increasing your education versus um, over uh, 14, where it was sort of too late if you were offered uh, the program, or too late to affect your education. It would still have these effects potentially on, on nutrition. Um, okay, so the data is the Mexican population census. Um, 
uh, we merged to that government data based on enrollment uh, at the household level. Uh, so we also use to control for kind of characteristics of the communities, uh, the marginality index, which is an official uh, poverty index that the Mexican government uh, creates. It's based on nine components, such as you know, proportion of households in the municipality that you know, don't have electricity or have a dirt floor. Um, and so we're going to focus on high and very high marginality uh, municipalities. This, again, is an official classification by the Mexican government. And these are where the municipalities, this is the the municipalities that was really the target of um, the government when the program started. So these are municipalities that have kind of more, you know, sort of a longer time uh, receiving uh, the program. So we have a measure of the rollout intensity, uh, and that is just defined by the number of households enrolled uh, uh, by year T divided by the number of pre-program households in the municipality as defined by the census. Okay, so this just um, shows you, this is just a general map showing the, you know, the enrollment uh, in the two waves uh, of, uh, in, of, uh, uh, of enrollment. Um, and so you can see it's, you know, that it's not that, okay, in the first phase, it was only in the south, and then in the second phase, there was only enrollment. In the north, there's sort of enrollment uh, nationwide in both, uh, you know, in both periods. Okay, so this, um, this graph shows, so this gets a bit at the question of you know, how comparable are the households that enter uh, the program in the first phase versus the, the second phase. Uh, so here we sort of ordered um, municipalities by their level of poverty. And so the households in our analysis are those um, that are in municipalities uh, that are poor or that are higher, poor or highly poor, and those are with the marginality index greater than than zero, um, and so the graph shows the proportion of, of new enrollment um, in the two time periods. Now you can see that those, you know, ideally those would have been um, kind of completely uh, like identical, uh, the, the pattern of enrollment. You can see that the households that enter early, uh, they tend to have, um, you know, they, you know, there's higher enrollment in the poor. Okay, so. So how do we control for that? Um, so we control uh, with the marginality uh, indicators. Um, and we also, we, inter you know, we interact those with our, our um, age cohort. I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, another issue is uh, migration, because uh, we're using um, just the 2010 census. And so you might say, well, you know, people have moved, you know, so they're not necessarily located in where they grew up with, uh, with um, uh, the program. And it might be, in fact, that the program affects uh, migration um, and that you have you know, sort of selection of who's in the municipality um, based on the program. So this is, uh, you know, this graph shows the results um, uh, by age, uh, sort of the number of people in, uh, in, the, you know, in the municipality. And what you can sort of see uh, is that there's really sort of no effect on the number of people of each age uh, in the municipality up until about age 17. And then uh, you can see that there's sort of a positive effect on the number of individuals, uh, age groups, ages higher than, than 18. Um, and so we don't, so as a result of this, what we do is we only focus you know, we only focus on the population effects on population that were between seven and seventeen uh, pre-program. So this is to avoid mm. uh, kind of having a selection on uh, out migration. So, so just to understand, so those who are older than seventeen in nineteen ninety seven were more likely to stay more in likely the municipality. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, right. the, there's more right. So there's right. a positive effect on number of individuals of that age in the municipality. <laughs> That's right, so that's likely to, to migrate out of, out of the municipality. Okay, so then just to um, kind of review then the strategy. Uh, so we're going to, you know, we're going to use all of the ages between 7 and uh, 19. Uh, we're going to then aggregate 
uh, to compare the, you know, sort of the group that's fully exposed. So the group we consider fully exposed are kids who were 7 to 11 uh, pre-programmed because they're sort of in the, you know, the right age to, you know, they haven't started secondary school and so they're sort of at a good, you know, good time to receive the program. If you were between the ages of 11 and 15, that's, you know, it's, you, we call them partially exposed, you know, because you could have still been, you know, maybe you were, you know, you failed a grade in primary school, so you're still potentially at the right age to, you know, the program got you at the right time before you entered a secondary bank. We call these groups partially exposed. And then 15 to 19 pre-program, we call them not exposed because they were just sort of too old, uh, really, to, to benefit from the program in terms of um, education. Okay, so the event studies will show all the, you know, each individual age, but then for the regression results, we, um, we aggregate to compare the fully exposed with the non-exposed. Okay, so here's then the, the summary of the, the evaluation uh, strategy. Uh, so, um, okay, so the, um, the strategy is, so the enrollment is our enrollment intensity. So this tells us how many uh, uh, households were enrolled uh, in the first uh, phase of the program and interacted uh, with uh, the age. And so our sort of main um, regression coefficient of interest is uh, beta. And so this gamma, you might say, what's this gamma? This is controlling for the total number of households that entered the program by 2005. And so what beta is really telling us is what the effect of sort of getting the program in the first phase versus the last phase. And then we control for the total number of households that receive the program by 2005. Yes? I'm a little confused about something. So is it right that you don't actually know whether the individual was enrolled? You're just, you have added uh -huh. information about that. We're using involved. administrative information. Yes. Mm -hmm. Got it. So how does that deal with the Migration, if people with more education move to another place, you're going to be attributing it to the enrollment in the other place? Right. So um, so the enrollment indicator is based <laughs> on, so um, so it's the, so the census has information on where you were living five years before and you also <laughs> had your state of birth. And so we use that to create, uh, you know, your enrollment intensity based on where you were likely to be living when you were. In the, in the Thank you. Okay, so our main um, impact estimate then is uh, from beta. So in in our extended regression uh, specification, we just control for the marginality uh, components uh, interacted with uh, each age with um, right, with uh, with the age groups or older or young. Um, and then we also I'm going to show I'm going to show the results. Of the regression specification, then I'll show the event study uh, specification, which show the effects basically for each um, each age, individual age. Okay, so these are the um, effects on education. Um, and what's nice is we have kind of all these other studies that we can compare, uh, so which helps um, you know sort of you know, this incredible amount. Not credible. Um, so, what do the effects say? Uh, so, in terms of the uh, grades uh, completed, so this says that you know, sort of the effect of growing up uh, with getting the program early versus uh, getting it late when there was really no, no effect on your education um, was an increase in grades completed of 1.3. Uh, okay, so is that uh, large or small? By the way, this is the effect both for men uh, and women. It's very, very similar. You don't see higher effects. On women, even in spite of the, the higher grants. Um, so, the so what was the sorry education before uh, the program started? And these are from um, uh, uh, 1990. Uh, so, you know, the sort of average years of completed schooling uh, was about 7.9 for for men and 7.7 7 for women, and so that represents an increase of between 15 and 20 percent. Okay, so, you know, this program, it's not a program that, you know, means you're going to go to college. <laughs> so it increases, uh, you know, average schooling by about 
uh, 15%. And so then we started to stagger and say, well, where does this increase uh, come from? And uh, so what's that? So these sort of these indicators below show what's the effect of the program on having some secondary, some high school, and some um, college. And so you can see uh, for a secondary, the effects are to increase the probability of having some secondary school for, for men, uh, 16.5 uh, percentage points, and that's from a baseline of about 58. 58% uh, of the population would have uh, some secondary schooling in the absence of the program. Uh, and so for women, actually, you see uh, a larger increase in terms of the proportion uh, that increase um, uh, in secondary school. So it's 29 uh, percentage point increase from a base of 54%. Um, uh, 54%. Uh, There's also significant effects in high school. And so the kind of where does this 1.3 grade increase uh, come from, and it comes uh, from secondary and high school. And so we looked also at college, and it would have been kind of nice to see even sort of small effects on university uh, enrollment, and you know maybe there will be some in later generations, but for now there are no, no significant effects on increasing college enrollment. So it's a program that increases schooling, uh, mostly in secondary and, and high school. Sure. One question. You yeah. this in subsequent slides, but I'm wondering, you know, given that you basically have kind of community level dosage, I wonder if there's like a nonlinearity such that, you know, going from 5% to 6% of the population doesn't matter, but going from, you know, 55 to a little bit like I, was there a kind of sweet spot that you guys were able to identify? Yeah, so this, um, so the proportions enrolled are much higher than that. In these four municipalities, so on average, by the end of 2005, 60% of the households have, have the program. So, sort of 30% enroll in the first state and another 30% in these municipalities in the second state. So, I, I don't know the answer to your question, but I, I think it's a good answer. Okay, let me show you that. I think I have to hurry up a little bit, but um, let me show you just the, the event studies. Um, and so, the event study is actually kind of nice uh, because you can look at uh, you know, by age, the effects of, so for education is a cumulative variable, so you would expect <laughs> that kids who are exposed for more time should show, you know, sort of fully exposed, should show greater effects on schooling than those who are partially uh, exposed. And so that's sort of exactly what you see if you look at these, um, uh, at the grades completed graphs, well, then you can see in all of, the, all of the graphs, but you see the sort of the kids from 7 to 11, that's our fully exposed. Uh, they have a kind of large increase uh, in uh, grades uh, completed. You can see the middle group, where the partially exposed have lower effects, and then uh, sort of the, the, the not exposed that we call the 15, 19 year olds who are in progressive families, but they're sort of too old to go back to school when they are families off of the program. There aren't any effects on, on education. And so this is uh, uh, sort of backs up our, our identification strategy. Okay. Um, what are the effects on labor market outcomes? Um, so here, as I sort of said in the preview, uh, it's really you know a, more of a women's <laughs> effect story. So the probability of working goes up. So these two specifications are with and without the controls for the, the marginality interactions. Uh, so the effects on working uh, for women increase between six and ten percentage points, so this is a very large increase compared to the proportion that works or pre-programmed, which is only about 26%. So this is a, you know, a third, an increase of up to a third in labor market participation for women uh, in this area. All of that increase is due to uh, jobs with income. And so there's lots of unpaid work that you know, women do in Mexico, but this increase in working is all uh, associated with uh, receiving a payment. So if you look at working the proportion of working for pay that increases in uh, basically exactly the same amount as the proportion uh, working. As a result, this is unconditional. Weekly labor out market hours also uh, increase. Um, uh, there's sort of no effect on the occupation in terms of uh, agriculture, no effect on health insurance, and monthly earnings uh, go up uh, by about 335 pesos. So this is very little 
in, in Mexico. This is only about you know, $15, but it's very large compared to what women uh, earn kind of pre-programming, which is on average 670 bits. So this is an increase of almost 15%. Again, why is it so hard? It's because very few women worked for me uh, before the program. So really the effect of the program is to increase a lot of uh, proportion of, of women working. And as a result, you know, more of them have, have um, income. Okay, for men, uh, there's no effect on the probability of working. So most men are working uh, with or without um, the program. Um, there's some effects on increasing weekly labor hours by about three uh, per week. Uh, there's a reduction, a kind of interesting reduction in the type of work, so they're less likely to be working in agriculture. So this is suggestive, uh, suggestive of sort of a, you know, some switching to non-agricultural uh, jobs. They're more likely to have health insurance. Again, it's a population that hardly anyone has health insurance. So prior to the program, 14% had health insurance. And so this increases a lot uh, for men. You know, where are the effects on earnings? You know, the coefficient, this is it's very noisy um, and not, not significant. So we can't really say that there are effects on earnings. Uh, for men, you know, there were no effects on working. And, you know, again, sort of Marco was alluding to this, if you have this increase in education, there's no effect on probably a working, you know, you, and no effect on earnings doesn't sound like the, that the, you know, the increase in schooling had a big uh, return. Okay. Uh, Okay, here's the event study graphs uh, for um, the labor market outcomes. Uh, now these are, you know, these are noisier than uh, the education uh, ones. Um, so you can kind of see the same pattern that you saw for education for the women um, uh, in the probability of uh, working um, and uh, for pay. Um, so, you know, this doesn't look good. So, you know, we sort of, when we saw this, we sort of de-emphasized the, the agriculture, um, you know, the effect on reducing population <laughs> agriculture. And the ones on earnings look, um, you know, also kind of, so, so they're very, they're, they're very noisy. All right. Um, I think, all right, these are um, looking at households. Uh, outcomes. Uh, so looking at sort of household monthly uh, labor income and also housing conditions. Um, uh, so this is an index of the you know, type of floor, uh, you know, type of walls, you know, whether you have electricity. Uh, we look also at the, your durable goods. And so this is also an index of you know, refrigerator, um, TV, uh, stove, uh, and so forth. And these also show, you know, so positive uh, effects and fairly large. So the coefficient is an interpretive um, you know, number of standard deviations. So uh, for instance, for men, um, the effects range from 0.12 to 0.16 standard deviation in terms of increasing um, ownership of, uh, of durable goods. Can I understand the household monthly labor income for women so this is in total household income in households in which women right. live. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so that's a huge effect, right? It's, it's we went up by you know a thousand yeah. or so pesos over a household income month mean of 1863. So that's right. more than a 50 percent increase in income. Yeah. So yeah. So we have <laughs> to work on this some more, but we sort of looked at um, kind of who's marrying who. <laughs> Right, because that's really where these results come from. Because uh, you know, the women are marrying, so everybody's higher education, right? And so that's you know, so it's sort of the net sum of you know the increase in each individual. But it does suggest that women are living in households that, on average, have fifty percent higher income, income than right. they right. would have in the absence of the program. And right. There's some kind of sorting. So women yeah. didn't get the program are now living in poor right. households, presumably, and. The, this is all due to marriage market and changing and matching. Uh huh. Yeah, we have to look more. Though. The thing is, our selection who marries. Mm -hmm. so not, you know, not everyone is married. Um, so, yeah, but when we looked at this, the most we could say is that people marry more educated. You know, it'd be nice to say they marry spouses with higher income. That would look. So you might say this suggests that. 
Let's talk more about that, though. I like that. <laughs> That's, um, yeah, um, I'm <clears throat> wondering about uh, external effects within the household and external effects within the public. Okay. And I'm not sure whether these big household yeah. effects we see here have anything to do with that, since I guess if the kids grow up and leave and we're talking about their current household, then maybe it says nothing about what's happening yeah. to their parents uh -huh. and siblings yeah. and so on. But <clears throat> I'm curious about that. Yeah. So yeah, so yeah, I should have actually prefaced um, this. So this includes both types of households. So where kids have already left, kind of their original household, and where they escape. So part of this could just be kind of the income effect of the program, where you know, people are living in better better households. So it's just so saying that that's important yeah, too. beneficiaries are are you know living in households with better conditions, but it could be just because their parents are better. Often they have moved down. So kind of entering into discussion phase. Of what we can okay. come on to finish up, and then we'll continue the discussion. Okay. Um, all right. I think then I will skip um, some of the sort of positive effects on on um, on migration, which you know, especially um, for both men and women. So increasing the probability. This is just migrating out of your municipality. So it might be um, that you just you know you went you know very close by, but you left. Uh, the municipality, there's, uh, so are you living in a new municipality versus your municipality five years ago? And that's, um, there's a large uh, increase of the program in doing that by about 10, 10 uh, percentage points. And also that you're much more likely to be in residing in urban areas as a result of the, of the program. Um, all right, well, I'm going to skip, I guess, the uh, uh, the robustness, we have a lot of uh, robustness, including kind of a falsification test where we replicate uh, in um, 1990 and we don't find any effects. Uh, we also do a lot with the migration because there's sort of different ways, you know, I have time to go into it, but there's different ways you can, you know, you can use the state of birth, you can use where you were living five years ago in terms of where you put the sort of enrollment intensity and our results are all uh, sort of robust to those those modifications. Um, and I wanted to show you the benefit cost ratio and then I'll, you know, I'll stop. Um, so, you know, kind of all cost benefit calculations have a lot of assumptions <laughs> in, um, you know, in them. So, so what we, you know, we did with this exercise, and we're actually kind of suspicious of cost benefit calculations. So what we tried to do was take very pessimistic assumptions. Um, so, to say, all right, you know, let's assume there's no earnings growth in Mexico, which actually the economy is totally tanked. So in fact, right now there is no <laughs> earnings growth. So that turned out to be a realistic uh, assumption. And then we said, okay, let's also assume the dead weight loss, you know, from the taxes that you need to collect to give this program are super high. So it's 60, 60 percent. Um, and so if you look, you know, you still, you know, with these pretty negative uh, assumptions, you know, no earnings and growth forever, you know, not just this year. Uh, and very high dead weight loss of raising taxes to pay uh, these benefits, you know, the cost benefit ratio uh, is still, you know, way above, uh, way above uh, one. Okay. And by so, benefits, you mean earnings? It's, it's, it's right. So it's comparing, you know, benefits to, you know, the cost of the program, including raising, you know, raising money to, to you know, pay the benefits of tax. Okay. So I will stop there. Um, so, uh, you know, we've found some, you know, some lasting impacts on education, uh, labor market outcomes. You know, we think these are, you know, they're fairly encouraging uh, for in terms of long-term trajectories. You know, there is this whole kind of other literature about whether transfers and so many programs, new programs now uh, with conditional and they're also unconditional transfers, like is it better to condition or not to condition. Africa programs tend to be more unconditional because it's harder to you know, there's fewer institutions to monitor uh, school attendance. There's also this literature on whether you, know, you really have to sort of pay people continuously. Couldn't you just sort of give them like a sum of money one time and maybe an asset like a cow, maybe that's enough to have sort of a big push towards reducing uh, poverty. So, we, you know, we can't really say uh, much about that. But what we can say is for, you know, for conditional transfers, at least have a chance in this story, they have to improve uh, children's lives. And so... Uh, you know, it's not good enough to say, all right, they increase schooling, kind of what's the longer term effect. And so, you know, we think there's some positive uh, tendencies uh, 
of uh, you know, the sort of initial long-term evaluation. Now, I really debated about putting this last uh, bullet, bullet point, but uh, I came down and uh, I'm putting it, uh, which is, you know, this past year, there's a new government in Mexico, Lopez Obrador, and um, so he called this a neoliberal program. It's the most evaluated program in the world, but in spite of that, uh, he's been dismantling uh, the, the program in favor of alternative programs that don't have a very good track record in previous evaluations, other contexts, uh, and that's the case of youth training subsidies. So I'll just end by saying that this policy change presents us with new uh, evaluate, evaluation challenges. Um, and also say that I, you know, I don't think it sort of diminishes the value of this work um, because there's still these millions and millions of children who grew up uh, with this program and you know, uh, the other countries look to Mexico for uh, what are the effects, uh, long-term effects of CCP. So thank you very much for... <laughs> Um, I, I'm not sure whether it would be possible to do anything different, but what we get is exactly what you say. I mean, the, the CCP program improves long-term trajectories, trajectories, but we don't actually know whether the conditionality has anything to do with that because we don't have a non-conditional one. And I was, I know they were trying to introduce all kinds of randomization and so on to make later studies possible but did they include any in which they randomized the conditionality i wonder not in mexico in other contexts so they're um, kind of the famous one in malawi where they randomized the conditional and the unconditional transfer has very you know there the results very interesting you know what do you get um or if you condition you get more education effects um but if you give unconditional you've got less early uh, fertility and early marriage. So, and that's because, you know, the problem with conditioning is not everybody gets the benefit, where it's unconditional, everybody receives whether or not um, kids go to school. So that also brings up kind of a targeting issue. Um, right? You just are the ones who don't comply, maybe the poorest. So. Yeah. So I was wondering what the kind of aggregate effect is on these communities all of a sudden, they become eligible. Community becomes eligible, mm -hmm. and then everybody's getting, everybody who has kids is getting more money. Everybody's going to school more. Uh, one thing that probably happens is that schools suddenly get more crowded, and there's no more money for the schools and no more teachers, so maybe yeah, quality education goes down. But also the expectations about how long you be in school, everybody else is in school, so you know, I mean, this kind of this big uh -huh. aggregate really effects that's going to be changing everybody's expectations and all that. Is, is, is one way to think about this program is it just speeds kind of the educational transition for these communities? They you know, the expected amount of schooling and the whole organization of life changes sooner than it would have without the program? Not really a question. Yeah, no, no, it's a great question. Very broad question. There's lots of Lots of kind of some questions in that question. So one, the school quality. Yeah, I mean that seems you know there's more kids going you know education effects for more kids going to school. So you know maybe that also has to do with the low effects on learning that have been observed. You know when the program started, there was additional budget to improve um, you know infrastructure. Uh, so but that that didn't continue. So I actually have another project looking at sort of the effects on the whole schooling infrastructure and quality. Um, quality side. Uh, but you know, I think you bring up a larger question, which is sort of the general equilibrium um, effects. And there's starting to be some research on that in other in other contexts. You know, there was some early work that said, well, what about prices? Right? Because all of a sudden there's all this extra cash circulating, especially on the day that beneficiaries get paid. You know, it's a huge influx. And so maybe prices at the local markets um, would go up. So in you know in the progressive case, the short run that did not occur, but I have started to see other studies where that, that has occurred. And so that's um, and there's a lot of other variables you could study with that, that in mind. So yeah, I think that's uh yeah, you know, some people are starting to argue that the negative, the spillover and negative effects could potentially be as large as the direct effects. I I think that's true, but, but it's, uh, and more studies are needed. Thank you.
Unless yes, well, yeah. so if I understand the migration results, those who are at least age 17 at baseline in 1997 were less likely to migrate, uh -huh. but the younger kids were more likely to migrate. Is that correct? How the Behrman is the probability. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. And so the the over 17s, they might be less likely to migrate because the program exists and they would not necessarily get those benefits if they migrated to a city. And then the younger kids who received the program, have, some of them have more education, and so then they went on to the urban center to do something with that secondary school education that they then got. Is that the idea? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a potential hmm. explanation. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, you know, for the older kids, yeah, I mean, the family's a little better off uh, because of all these years of the program, so maybe that makes them less likely to migrate to the U.S. We do actually have information on migrants to the U.S. Which hmm. is, uh, or distinguish where people migrate. Yeah. So it, it, the data sets that are big enough to look at the households to really understand, is it those you know 17 year olds that had younger kids and so the family was receiving benefits? Are those mm -hmm. the ones that are less likely to migrate? Or uh, it, would, it would just be fascinating to see the, the, the within household dynamics. Of, uh -huh. Right, because the sort of the graph that showed 17 year olds were less likely to migrate, those are all yeah, but are they the ones that have younger siblings that, that uh -huh. receive yeah. money into the household? Or they, yeah. no, they have, you know, once they, they yeah. themselves have kids and they're they, they want to sit around because they get the benefits. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and then the, those household income results, I and mean, those are, I mean, it, it could be the actual labor market effects, the only labor market effects. It could be the marriage sorting. And uh -huh. It could also be some of them are moving to the urban area where wages are higher. Right? Correct. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of different things that, that we could go on. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a nice suggestion. Okay, can we look at whether the, the spouse, the husband, is from the same municipality? Yes, where the husband was born mm -hmm. and where the husband lived five years before. I'm going to give you some traction whether it's just. You know, sort of uh -huh. or wage. How many you just married? How many you married? Uh -huh. yeah. No, I think that's a good, that's a good Okay, thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Thank you.